So what does it take to be an environmental steward? And again, what we're looking at is, you know, you have to be aware of your environment, the farm's environmental risk, okay? If your lagoon is overflowing, for example, you know, uh, what is that risk? What, is the, what are people going to think that, in that type of thing? And again, we talk about no point discharges. Again, trying to maintain a, a level in our lagoons or slurry uh, type systems so we don't have discharges. We can look at uh, balanced nutrients. And again, uh, and the, the, one of the questions I have for you today, how many have lagoons in the audience? Okay, how many wish they didn't have lagoons? Okay, okay. How many have uh, slurry systems, slurry type storage systems? Okay, deep pits, deep pit barns, okay? So what we're gonna do, we're gonna cover all of those aspects today uh, and uh, my thoughts now, when I, in South Dakota, we used to have lagoons, and I use the word used to, and uh, some of them worked really quite well. But again, when we got into our colder climates, again, bacterial activity and all that uh, didn't quite work as well as we thought it would. So most of our systems that I'm familiar with are really slurry type based systems. But anyhow, when we talk about that, Again, one of our major emphasis is really balancing those nutrients uh, coming, off the, uh, coming off the farms. And we have folks that are building uh, confinement barns, uh, uh, double wide units, just for the manure, because of the value of that manure. And so lagoons and those types of things where we're taking out some of that nitrogen, et cetera, really, really doesn't pay. Again, yeah, implement that nutrient management plan. We really emphasize that a lot to make sure that we have enough acres uh, to be able to put that manure on. Is a good neighbor. Okay, this also comes into play. So, for example, if you're applying manure, it's you know probably good not to do it on graduation day or somebody's uh, wedding or those types of things. Okay, so it's an idea of really being aware of what's happening in the community and uh, just to be a good neighbor and know the rules. Okay, and I'm sure your Missouri DNR and Department of Natural Resources has a, a set of rules. I took a look at, at some of those and how those uh, relate to you. And again, you consider that environment. If you're in the plan of expansion mode, what do I need to do to make sure that I meet all these environmental regulations and also maintain that good neighbor? So what can be the issues? Okay. And again, I use the word can be because for some of you that may not be an issue at all. Again, we look at sludge, sludge accumulation and no agitation. Maybe it's not maintaining enough freeboard. So if you have a heavy rainstorm, we're overflowing that, flowing the lagoon, pumping on the same ground year after year. And we've had cases. You know, again, you know, again, getting back to the old days, I mean, if you were in a dairy barn, for example, that 40 acres right next to the dairy barn was the most nutrient-rich piece of ground you had on the farm. Because that was the easiest thing to do, get it out of the barn, take it out, spread it. So, again, what we look at, again, crop uptake, how it, how it relates to a corn, corn ground, for example, and, and make sure that we balance that. Uh, maintenance plan, and then we'll talk a little bit, not too much on odors, uh, foam, and the numbers. Okay, what do the numbers really mean, and uh, are they acceptable? So when we look at planning and evaluating uh, manure storages, what are we looking at? Again, we talk about, first of all, manure collection and, the, uh, and transport methods. We want to look at it, we're going to treat it. What would what, be what the desired treatment? Are we looking at anaerobic treatment, for example? Nutrient conservation or loss, okay? Can we afford the loss on nitrogen, for example, in today's world? And again, looking at that land application and nutrient utilization. So what are the types? What are the types? Again, my familiarity is going to be with underfloor uh, deep pit barns, okay? We can look at earth basin type barns. It can either be a slurry type uh, earth basin or it can be a lagoon. And oftentimes we may have what we call a lagoon, but in essence it's really a slurry basin. Okay? Again, depending on the conditions on how well it was designed to start with, have we overloaded it, 
uh, etc. A lot of, like I said, in South Dakota, a lot of times we started out with the lagoon, but in essence it ended up being a slurry, just a, basically a slurry storage. Okay, so let's look at anaerobic manure storage and uh, some of the things that uh, we, we look at. Again, of course, the advantage uh, at the time, again, we're maybe the least cost, you know, storage per unit. Again, you could hold large amounts. I mean, it was uh, large amounts of manure and or runoff, if that was the case. Uh, prevented, you know, more of that treatment. Uh, we looked at reducing odors, degrading the solids. And uh, again, enables uh, handling the manure with manure or pumping, irrigation type and spreading equipment. So, again, when you looked at it, that, and again, nitrogen wasn't worth 50 to 60 cents a pound at that particular time or maybe, you know, a number of years back, but now when we look at it, really what is the value? Do we want that anaerobic digestion to take place? And again, I know you've had some of the, you know, the issues. Again, we talk about what are the key components when, when designing an anaerobic lagoon? Okay, first of all, it's volatile solids, okay? There's a specific value for volatile solids from the northern part of Missouri down to the southern part of Missouri. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But again, what we're trying to do here, again, we look at the acid-producing bacteria. Acid-producing bacteria, again, we have odor, odorous volatile solids, or odorous volatiles, and then methane-producing bacteria, which also generates other gases. So that's quite simply how it's supposed to work. How many of you have this type of situation later in the summer, the Purple Lagoon? Okay. Would you say that the odor level on those are pretty good or lack none if you get it to work, if you get it to work? This, and if you can get this type of situation, again, uh, this is how we look at really an ideal situation on a lagoon. Okay. So we have odor-producing bacteria, uh, but odor-eliminating bacteria, the purple sulfur bacteria, uh, taking, taking that up and creating this type of uh, sheen in a, in a lagoon. So part of it now, when we start sizing these things, again, we've got to determine the, the, the rate of manure. How much manure are we going to add? Okay, we, then we look at the volatile solids. Uh, in the manure re government rate of uh, usually four to four and a half pounds is what, when I look at it from our standards of volatile solids, and that's per thousand cubic feet, of uh, pond volume, okay, per thousand cubic feet. And again, what we're looking at is percentage of uh, that percentage of volatile solids, depending on how many pigs you have, the weight that you're dealing with, and again, looking at the biological activity. So when we look at the load, the permanent pool size, this is how we it should be designed. Again, we're going to have a, 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 a permanent pool here. And this is where the activity needs to take place, or has, takes place. We have a storage volume as we start filling that manure, and then we're going to have freeboard, freeboard here, again, to allow for uh, any event or rainfall event that exceeds our 25-year, 24 24 24-hour storm. Okay? So, and the other unfortunate part end up in that sludge accumulation. Now, when we look at the next one, how should it be designed? Okay, we have to allow enough volume for accumulated sludge uh, the, for periods between sludge removal events. So when you look at that part of it now, how often was your particular system designed? Was it for five years? Was it for 10 years? Was it for 20 years? Or were you told that you never had to remove the sludge period? And I think in some of your cases, I think that was the case, okay? Again, you have your minimum treatment volume here, and there we show like a six-foot minimum. Really, you take care of your sludge as well as your minimum treatment volume. When your sludge layer gets to be about six or eight feet within a lagoon, you certainly have issues at that particular point. Not only that, but you've taken off you know, your treatment volume. You don't have enough area for treatment volume now. Again, our volume here for wastewater uh, and clean water accumulated during the treatment period depth for your normal participation, depth for the 25-year, 24-hour storm, 
and then the freeboard on top. In this case, one minute. I'm not sure what Missouri's requirements are on freeboard. I know in South Dakota, ours for, for any outdoor storage is our, our two, two feet. Okay. So again, what we do, again, looking at the drawdown, taking it from the, the depth here, the precipitation, and taking down then to our, our treatment volume. We look at construction. Again, just by law requirements, you need to have a licensed uh, registered professional engineer to lay that out for you. Again, soil boarding, uh, we use ours as our three to one burn slopes. Again, mainly so we can uh, uh, easily uh, uh, maintain the berms uh, as far as mowing and that type of thing for a tractor and, and also you know, keep everything cleaned up. Again, linear and monitoring wells may be required. All right, so we look at earth storage basin specifications. What we're looking at, again, the vertical, one vertical to three horizontal on our side slopes. In the top of that berm, I show a minimum, a minimum of eight feet, but really, in reality, it should be at least 10 foot wide for the berm. Again, for that maintenance factor, easy maintenance. We need to look at site and soil investigations, properly constructed and sealed controlled, uh, designed in the basics of temperature as well as the manure volume. Again, that's part of our issue in the northern climates. Uh, when I look at volatile solid loadings, we probably have to be in that six range, six to seven, to actually make a, a lagoon works. And our activity is only from maybe April at best through November. Whereas you're down in Missouri, you have a little bit wider range as far as that biological activity. So, Again, we talk about startup, and again, proper startup procedures uh, are, are essential. The single most important, really developing a lagoon that performs well. So if we didn't start it up properly, we're going to probably have trouble all the way through. Uh, treatment volume is based, again, as I said before, it's based on that volatile solid loading number. And volatile solids are the organic if the definition of that would be that they're the organic solids in the manure that can be uh, degraded by bacteria. A new lagoon must contain a volume of water equal to the de design treatment volume in order to have the design uh, volatile solid rate, to have the design volatile solid rate. A lagoon going with only half the treatment volume, okay, filled with water at a startup will experience 100% overload, okay. And the good, uh, good, use good planning to show that water is available to fill the treatment volume of a new lagoon before manure is added. So adding that fresh water to start is essential. And again, we talk about pre-filling that water or treatment volume uh, with fresh water to ensure that we can get the volatile solid loadings to balance, to balance out. Insufficient volume, if you look at that, uh, startup causes excessive odor. Uh, lagoon started with... Uh, uh, insufficient water volume can lead to problems. And again, ideally it should be started in the spring or uh, early uh, summer to take advantage of the warmer temperatures. And again, bacteria have a chance here to become established before it slows during the fall and winter. And again, lagoon startup should be considered planning. All right, again, long-term uh, manure loading to lagoon should not exceed the design volatile solid loading. So if you start exceeding that volatile solid loading, you're going to start having uh, issues with it. Again, exp avoid expanding numbers without expanding the lagoon. So you were designed for, you know, 4,800 head on a grow finish barn and then expand another 4,800. Uh, you're going to have some issues. Okay. Alternates to main volatile and solid loadings rate increase with animal numbers. So you can, there are ways of getting around that somewhat. We can look at using solid separation as one, adding lagoon volume or other pretreatments. And the lagoon should be located in a, because loaded in a consistent manner. In other words, we don't like to, again, we look at lagoons as far as slug loading. Again, it's manure is degraded by bacteria, salts, and uh, minerals. Uh, pump down, rain off, lot runoff, wash water, etc. tend to remove and dilute and get those saw levels to acceptable, uh, acceptable levels. And extended dry periods like we've had the last year anyway, 
high evaporation, little or no fresh water uh, coming in or wash can lead to elevated salt levels. How many are experiencing that now? Okay. What is your solution? <laughs> okay. Anybody have a solution with elevated salt levels? Besides adding more water, you know, to keep the dilution. Okay. So I know, it, it, like I said, it, it's, it can be an uh, issue and lead to, again, what happens is that we're inhibiting our bacterial activity and, and leading to reduced. Uh, so accomplished by increasing the odors, uh, again, we have higher sludge buildup possible here and the generally souring of the lagoon. All right. So we talk about elect elect uh, electrical conductivity, and then there's our meters that can test for that, get your conductivity. So we talk about monitoring uh, all manure storage, and again, the activities are advisable uh, for manure storage and some monitoring uh, activities. All monitoring activities are evidence uh, of poor uh, stewardship. Okay, these are just some checklists to, to go through. Periodic uh, inspections, regular inspection schedule uh, developed based on the uh, system type, and a record of, uh, of uh, inspections of evidence in environmental stewardship. Okay. Monitoring the liners. If you do have a liner, a liner barrier between the contaminants and the groundwater should be regularly expected. Uh, Okay, liners can be eroded, uh, wave action, and those types of things can help uh, barring rodents. Seepage on the backside, uh, it's not a good thing, okay, these lagoons. Record keeping, stewardship, manure levels. When manure is removed from the storage, amount of removal removed from the storage, and nutrient control of manure storage, lab analysis. And again, I can't emphasize that more. I know on a lagoon, uh, if you're agitating that, that is very difficult to get a consistent, consistent uh, manure rate. But we have to figure out, you know, what what the level of nutrients are in there. Okay. Again, aesthetics and appearance, and uh, again, a critical uh, environmental protection uh, is or may not be critical, but are major factors in perception. Again, formed by the public. Uh, tour groups, regulatory personnel, and others. So, you, and again, we have to maintain a good quality look. And again, keep the, uh, the weeds and all of that down so everything is clean. Uh, helps, again, from a perception standpoint. May not make your lagoon work any better, but at least from a perception standpoint. Chemical additives. Don't know uh, to manure for odor and gas control. I'm sure if you walk the show today, there's a number of those out there. And all I can say is, uh, you know, check to see if they've had any testing done on it uh, by third party and just kind of go from there. Uh, we look at manure treatment, uh, manure additives are stored in uh, liquid uh, pH modifiers, digestive enzymes. We got uh, oxidizing agent, disinfectants. Uh, Absorbents, enzyme inhibitors, uh, sarsaparins from yucca, and masking agent. Anybody using any of these manure treatment? Anybody treating at all? Okay. All right, sludge. Here is a, just an estimate of how to figure out what your sludge volume is going to be. Again, we look at SV, sludge volume, 365 days times your animal units. Okay, an animal unit is a thousand pounds. So how many pigs within that uh, number of thousand pound animal units? Your total solids and pounds per animal unit per day. Your sludge accumulation ratio. And then uh, that T would be your total sludge time in years. Okay. So if we're looking at a, a five year period before agitation or a 10 year, this is when, from an engineering standpoint, this is the equation that people would use to make that determination. Now, when I said that the numbers, when we look at that, again, we look at swine, and this comes from uh, uh, at 0.0485. Again, that's cubic feet per pound total solids. So, again, it's a real small percentage, but as time goes on, that percentage can add up. And so, uh, 
if you have a excessive sludge accumulation, the only alternative you really have uh, is either clean it out and start over uh, or just kind of maintain maybe every three, two to four years an agitation program to get rid of it. Okay? So, so again, the lagoons need to be agitated. I understand that you were told back in the earlier days here that they did not. And unfortunately, that was probably the wrong, wrong information. Again, we look at that accumulation. You may have a design low, but you have to look at it and say, okay, is it 10 years, 20 years, 5 years? Where are you at? If you've got 8 foot of sludge in a lagoon, you have, there's some issues uh, to take care of. All right, so again, on closure, if you are closing out a lagoon, uh, in this case we had 10,000 cubic feet of sludge uh, that has to be land applied. And when you look at that, again, our purpose here, if we look at a complete uh, nutrient uh, uh, CNP plan, protects the surface and groundwater. I uh, want to eliminate the safety hazards, safeguard public health, health, uh, applying remaining, remaining uh, nutrients at agronomic rates. Again, we need to document, uh, decommission the storage, okay? Breach and backfill uh, conversions to fresh water. All right, so as far as the operation, again, overall operations, we need to monitor that sludge, uh, dewater at least uh, yearly on the crop, and then watch staff gauge and keep the uh, liquid between the maximum and the minimum <laughs> is where you wanna be. Okay, pump down, minimum uh, monitoring pump down, uh, manure level markers. Again, markers should be uh, durable and uh, treated pulse, six by six pulse may work for that. Notching that pulse so that you know where those uh, levels are. Uh, when the uh, levels, again, at which the overflow will occur. And then the uh, fraction storage uh, currently filled. Okay. Again, we talk about pump markers. Uh, they need to be defined as a portion of the manure storage facility. Okay, uh, Pump down our management indicators for the operator so that we can get what our fill rate. And then when we start pumping out, pump down markers are installed to show critical uh, liquid elevations. So if you're getting to that point of being overflowing, uh, you, you need to do something. In many cases, pump down are required. Okay, Again, we get a... Uh, Position here uh, in the side of the uh, berm here, and again the notch outs again with your your treatment volume, and then you go up as far as what the your manure storage, uh, rainfall, etc., minus your evaporation, and then the 25-year, 24-hour storm, and then we have our spillway. Again, a single vertical post, uh, the notch, notch. And with a mark on it uh, so that you know where you're at, essentially know where you're at. Staff gauges, again, mark start loving no higher than the bottom, okay. Have a rain gauge, etc. Maintenance, every two weeks you need to inspect the berm for erosion, animal barrels, etc. I don't know what your requirement in Missouri are, but uh, again, if the, uh, they'll pretty much tell you how much, you know, you have to walk the site to make sure that you don't have a, a situation. Again, you want to maintain quality vegetation on the berms, okay? Whether it be grass or whatever, inspect the liner, if you got a liner there. Perform regular monitory well test, if applicable, okay? All right, so let's just start, you know, talking a little bit about nitrogen. Again, uh, these are the different manure handling systems that we can take a look at. If you're a daily, uh, let's just look at an underfloor pit. Our nitrogen loss on the average is going to be about 15 to 30 percent. Our nitrogen retained will be about 70 to 85 percent in that manure. You have an above ground tank, 10 to 30, 70 to 90. Okay. Holding pond, slurry, 20 to 40 nitrogen loss, 60 to 80. And you notice here there's, there's ranges, and of course we go to the anaerobic lagoon, our nitrogen loss was like 70 to 85 percent. And hopefully, you know, 15 to 30, again, depending on how much sludge you're bringing up and uh, trying to maintain those levels. So, when we look at applying manure, 
or storages? Where's our, our, our issues? Okay, first of all, we can have runoff, surface runoff, either from the storage or from the field. Okay. Second of all, we can have uh, leaching to the groundwater. Okay, if this isn't sealed properly, we're going to either leach the groundwater or if we overapply here, possible leaching nitrates, for example, down in, into the, uh, into the uh, groundwater. Again, private well, well casings, uh, probably not, not so much. I haven't had a, we haven't had a blue baby syndrome that I'm aware of in a long, long time, but that was part of the issues. Uh, we had uh, feedlots, for example. The wells were right almost in the feedlot or in it, and uh, manure actually would go, get down in there. The nitrates would get down in the, in the again, uh, precipitate ammonia deposition and then flow, macropore flow. All right, so let's look at the nutrient levels. And this, by the way, is uh, one of, came from one of your publications. If we look at, at swine lagoons, for example, the rating here on total nitrogen from that lagoon now, and this is in pounds per acre inch, and an acre inch is equal to about 27,000 gallons. Okay, so when we look at a swine lagoon now, we're talking a total end of 100 to 300 pounds per acre inch. So if you were going to put on an inch of water with your slurry system, or I mean with your, say for example, a big gun, I should say, uh, a gun, we would anticipate something from 100 to 300. Now as I understand, the 100 number is really related to more shallow lagoons, and that that 300 number is related to deeper lagoons, and deeper maybe such as 18 foot deep. And this is where some of the controversy came in, because everything was based on a more of a shallow lagoon. Uh, yeah. Just for a second. Sure. Somebody might be smelling smoke. They say there's something going on the roof. The roofers, the hallway is full of smoke, but they just don't tell if we're fine. <laughs> God, that's the first for me, smoking. <laughs> okay, all right, so, so this kind of gives you, gives you a, at least a, 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 a place to start, all right? We have organic end, we have ammonia end, uh, phosphorus, and of course potassium. Now again, look at a swine pit, again, that's based on a thousand gallons. 30 to 45 organic, uh, 20 phosphorus, and of course then we have dairy lagoons and, and uh, etc. So it is a matter of how you set these things up, and you have to get a lab analysis to find out where you're where you're starting at, where, where your starting point is. All right, so we look at prices now, and we look at urea. This happens to be 2003 comparison to 2011. We look at, at 52 cents for urea, okay? And this is cents per pound, cents per pound. Phosphorus, we're looking at 55 cents a pound. Potash, 47, versus 12, 14 for uh, phosphorus, and then 25, the price has doubled. So this is why you can see, you know, where we actually put a number now on the value of manure, all right? So if you're pumping and giving it away, you're actually giving away a phenomenal amount of nutrient and nutrient value, okay? So manure is a fertilizer. Again, a mixed fertilizer you can't balance a nutrient need as we can with fertilizer. Fertilizer is a lot easier to work with uh, versus manure. You can you apply it at a rate. But you get so much N and so much P with that particular rate. And if you apply for N needs, you're usually going to over apply for P. Okay? So if you apply for the N crop needs, then you may end up, like I say, you may be regulated that you have to balance with the P value rather than the N, and then you have to just side dress or whatever to get your nitrogen up. Land application issues, again, with nitrogen, 
And again, we talk about groundwater quality because nitrates can leach through if they're over applied, leaching of it through the soil. And again, we have to control that, control that at a factor rate. And phosphorus is more of a surface. Uh, phosphorus runs off the field, gets into the rivers, gets into the lakes. That's where phosphorus comes into play here. Okay, nitrogen considerations with manure. Uh, the largest crop need of the applied nutrient. If the crop doesn't use nitrate, you, you, if you don't use it, like last year with the drought, uh, we're going to have nitrogen left in those, in those fields. So that's where a soil test is going to have to come into play now. You have to find out where you're at because if your crop got pretty much decimated you know, with the drought this last year, you didn't use up all those particular nutrients. Okay, so we got again, we take, keep that in, into consideration. And again, ammonia, urea, organic, and it actually converts to, to nitrates. Crop needs two to half to four more in than P when you look at that, and when you look at the, from a crop standpoint. And again, manure equal amounts of plant available in P. Therefore, if you meet the end of the crop, you over apply. So pea soil test uh, bills, or you need to you know, monitor that. So the three major goals here on land application is, number one, you want to prevent nitrate accumulation in the soil. Okay? If your core needs 200 pounds, that's what, it, you know, that's what you need to put on. Prevents phosphorus movement uh, in the fields. Okay? and then prevent nutrient deficiency in the crops because you don't want to under-apply either. You're going to get the maximum value. All right, so if you're putting it on, like for a lagoon now, uh, you need to inspect the pumps, uh, piping and applicator for potential leaks, and repair as needed. Okay. Again, monitoring uh, during pumping uh, and... <laughs> Again, it's kind of in a way, I mean, we've had cases where we busted pipes and we had enough fluent uh, that would hit the high line wires. Not a good, not a good situation. But so again, you, you have to have equipment. What's real advantage here, if you can get that equipment to shut down and, uh, and once that pressure drops, that, you know, you automatically shut that off. Okay. And again, automatic shutoff devices. Very, very necessary here. Okay, irrigation system, we need to be monitoring that. And again, you need to balance the amount of nutrient needs with what you're putting on. Okay. Okay, large amounts, again, I get a pipe break. And uh, we're running hoses all over the place. I mean, we have, uh, you know, systems we're putting on manure five miles from the site. So I know it can be done, but it takes a, a certain amount of, uh, of, uh, management and operation to be able to do that. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit yet about the solid manure handling. Uh, like I said, this is where I'm more, much more familiar uh, in the systems and most of our barns today in South Dakota or Minnesota, uh, just because of requirements by law, we are not allowed to uh, put outdoor manure storage, just period, with the exception of, uh, of uh, Harvester tanks would be acceptable, a concrete tank would be acceptable, but earth basin for swine is not, uh, not even allowed, especially in Minnesota. So most of our systems, uh, at a minimum, we're going to go to at least an eight foot deep pit. And a lot of our systems today, because of the trying to get the storage requirement, uh, beyond our case is 270 days, we like to have 365 days, so they're going with 10 foot deep pits. So what are the advantages with slurry manure? Again, less volume, higher solids uh, content, adaptable to tank storage, uh, either under floor. Uh, tanks can be covered for odor control, straw covers. Uh, less nutrient loss, and manure can be higher, ha handled hydraulically. Here are some of the disadvantages. Again, we may have higher odor potential but I, than a lagoon. That's, again, a pr I should preface that with properly operating a lagoon or solid manure. Gases from poorly ventilated underfloor pits may affect animals, and toxic or combustible gases accumulate in an enclosed area. Again, you, on that last one, you can get by, or not get by, but you can, if you have proper ventilation in these barns, 
uh, you're going to be in really good shape as far as that gas level. I guess one of the concerns people have, if I go with pit, uh, a deep pit barn, I'm going to have gas problems, and that can be you know, really farther from the truth. As long as you put proper ventilation, proper fans, enough fan capacity, proper inlet placement so you get good air distribution, we have extremely little problem with that. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you are in the first session, talked about pigs dying. The number one reason that pigs die when the ventilation goes off is from heat stress. It is not from gases. Okay? Uh, we do have run into an instance, uh, I ran into one here a couple weeks ago, uh, where the barn was a breeding gestation barn, 12 rows, 120 foot wide, and they were having ammonia issues on the outside perimeter. But again, that problem really came from the fact that uh, they were not getting proper air distribution to those outside areas. So again, fresh air, fresh air distribution takes care of that gas situation. Can we look at disadvantages here? Hauling many loads, uh, most of that we do with tow lines now and uh, do some yet with the tankers, but a lot of it we've gone with uh, tow lines and injected toolbars. All right, so we look at the manure characteristics now, and again, we look at, from the standpoint of grow finish, deep pit barns, manure produced per pig space, about 3,500 pounds. Our total end concentration, again, these are just average values, about 50 pounds the end per 1,000 gallons. Ammonia, 33, phosphorus, 42 pounds per 1,000. If we have uh, wet, dry feeders, again, 25, we're look, typically looking at a little bit more. It's a little bit less water waste. We're talking about 75 pounds, okay, per 1,000, 50 pounds of ammonia, 54 phosphorus. Grow finish in an earthen pit, outdoor storage, 32, 24. So we have a little bit more loss uh, with those earthen storages. So it kind of gives you, again, a ballpark of what you're working with. But again, you still need to test. You need to test uh, uh, that mixture, the slurry. Okay, when we design underfloor manure storages, again, for the walls, uh, the recommendation here is 4,000 PSI concrete and grade 60 rebar. Okay, there are recommendations here for verticals as well as horizontal on these, on these pits. And normally we're set up on a 10-foot grid. Uh, 10 by 10, as far as our uh, beams, as well as our, 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 uh, our columns, concrete columns. Again, one uh, reference I want to point out here, if you're looking at concrete manure storages, and that's Midwest Plan Service 36, okay? Concrete manure storage. In fact, on our uh, recommendations with our DNR permitting, that's one of the recommended uh, uh, pieces of... Uh, of design information that, that you can use or could use in, in our state anyway to make, make recommendations is that Midwest plan. It's really one of the, the very few uh, publications out there that uh, cover this particular uh, topic. Okay. All right, again, pit annexes, putting out the pit annexes. Annexes, uh, again, you want to maintain at a minimum between your manure surface and the bottom of this beam, you need to maintain about a foot if you're using pit fans on that building, okay? Because we have to allow airflow to fl flow freely through that. Uh, we have cases, again, and that's some of the reasons we've gone to deeper pits, where we start filling up and all of a sudden in November we, d we don't have any ventilation because we've plugged it up plugged it up to the surface. So you have to account for that. You have to account for that, leaving that open. And if you go with transitions, the same thing really holds true there with transitions. Earth basin, again, uh, except for, for dairies, there's, in our state are still allowed. But if you look at this one, I mean, this does not give you a very good impression of what a basin with all the weeds and everything going around there. It's not a very clean, uh, clean look. Same thing though, we talked about soils investigation, mowing and the berm maintenance are very important. Okay, agitation, no question here that agitation is required. 
I know cases on breeding gestation barns uh, that I've worked with with producers, and uh, when you have to take a snowblower down there to, to break up the solids, uh, you got again a situation. And a lot of cases, uh, you know, where we have sows and in, in breeding gestation, we just put the hose down and suck whatever we can suck out. But eventually, even there, sludge can get to be a problem. Okay. And we talk about access ports, uh, make sure you got enough ports so you get good proper agitation throughout, and space requirements, uh, again, for beams and all, that, all of that. Berms, I should say. And like I said, most of our, a lot of our systems today were set up with tow line, toolbar, and uh, again, we size everything pretty much, again, according to the crop needs. Uh, Fortunately, in some cases, we we're short, actually short of phosphorus in some areas, so uh, we uh, uh, are able to uh, again handle this pretty relatively easy because we have enough corn, corn acres, uh, alfalfa, those types of things to be able to put manure on. So we're really in a, and I hate to say that we're really in an ideal situation uh, in in on our particular Minnesota, South Dakota, as far as manure application. All right, the last thing I want to cover, for those that have gone deep pit or anything that where you have a reception pit, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about safety. And I think one of the things you have to remember about this stuff, it does give off toxic gases, and that toxic gas typically is hydrogen sulfide. Okay, so that can be generated when, when you have manure is agitated. You can kill pigs with it. Uh, you can... And we can also experience, uh, unfortunately, human loss with it. And again, it's hydrogen. I mean, you'll get the reports it was methane, it was carbon dioxide and all that. No, it was hydrogen sulfide. And again, when you, when you pump a pit, you've got to maintain maximum ventilation uh, in that barn. You've got to be able to uh, get those gases out of there. All right. This is probably the toughest thing that you'll ever have to do if you ever experience it. You do not allow anyone to enter a manure tank without a self-contained uh, breathing apparatus, and you need to use the buddy system. Again, how often have you heard where one person goes down, the next one goes down to try and save it, and then the next one, and then the next one, and they all die. And so that is one of the toughest things that if that happens, that you would ever have to do. So you need to have a self-contained breathing apparatus, and if it does go, you need to call your emergency people because they do have that equipment. Uh, you ventilate the pit before entering, uh, wear that respirator. Uh, that's, again, the self-contained cartridge masses, uh, N95 3M masks are not adequate for this type of application. Okay. Again, rescue uh, safety harnesses, and then make sure you have a couple of people that can pull you out of there when you pass out. We had a case in South Dakota where one person, it was a reception pit, reception area, there, it was plugged, manure got loose, came in, that person passed out, the dad, or actually the uncle went in to save it, both of them passed away. So that's why I say if you have one thing you want to take home today, it is that. Okay. All right, so at the end here, we look at manure and how people will look at it. Is it a contributor to pollution or is it a benefit to the environment? I think, again, the benefit of environment and soil quality. There's no question that adding manure, soils, uh, uh, very good. The source of uh, O2, uh, oxygen depletion compounds, pathogens. It's a source of recycled nutrients, okay? Source of odors and air quality and contaminants or an opportunity for sequestering uh, atmospheric carbon. And uh, we have cases too where we have covered, covered some of our holding ponds and collecting uh, methane off of those ponds. Again, we talk about carbon sequestrations that are very expensive. I think to put a cover on that, to, to burn off that methane, it was like a $300,000 bill. Okay, for one dairy producer we have. So, uh, when you look at all of this and uh, the opportunities, different systems, again, you have to make sure that uh, uh, things are in order.